Hi, how's it going, everybody? And welcome to the Debutify podcast, the premier e-commerce podcast brought to you by Debutify. I'm your host, Alex Bond, and joining me today is Samir Balwani, the CEO and founder of Query, which is a media agency that helps e-commerce and DTC brands accelerate their growth. Samir is a true marketing strategist and thought leader with over 15 years of marketing experience. On this episode, we talk about paid advertising, brand awareness campaigns versus performance campaigns, what metrics are most important and much, much more. Here's our interview now. Samir, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're happy to have you on. So first off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your media agency, Query? Yeah, so Query is a media buying agency for high growth e-commerce businesses. So we've created a process that allows us to help our brand scale profitably in a sustainable and predictable way. Right. A lot of times e-com businesses like to grow in like very spiky and kind of taking advantage of whatever they have ahead of them versus really having a framework from which they can look at their campaigns and figure out what's the best channel, what's the best audience, what's the best creative, what are we testing to make sure we're being uh, incrementally growing in a day-to-day basis. And so that's what we do. And we do it extremely well. We do it for eight figure plus uh, e-com businesses. No, that's good. So that kind of already gives me like a, a range in y'all's capabilities. Yeah. I mean, eight figures is pretty big in my opinion. And so it's more, it's like mid-market to enterprise for more. So people that have figured out product market fit, they have a brand, they really understand the value of their brand. Nine out of 10 times, uh, clients coming to us because they've kind of hit that plateau where they're trying to figure out a lot of times, you know, will end up happening. It's, I've reached this amount. We're happy with our media, but How do we get to the next level? How do we spend an extra 500,000? How do we spend an extra million in advertising? Where does it go? What does it mean for the business? That's the kind of stuff that we love to tackle and how we help kind of help our clients really think through that work. No, that's great. And and when I actually was looking into your company a little bit, I saw that you guys have essentially a a two-pronged approach to your paid media process, which kind of boils down to brand awareness campaigns and performance campaigns. Can you elaborate on that process a little bit? Yeah, I think one of the big things that we identified is a lot of direct-to-consumer brands, a lot of e-com brands have always been performance first and always performance and, and driving that return on ad spend, really focusing on growth from that perspective, almost the detriment of brand building and long-term brand investments. And so what we do is we kind of marry the two together. We help our brands really think through how do we use the profit that we're driving from our performance media to fuel brand awareness that allows us to continue to grow the brand and introduce the brand to new companies customers. So that way it then cycles into our performance media and everything grows together. And striking that delicate balance requires true subject matter expertise in media buying and and e-com media buying in particular, as well as a really good understanding of data analytics, attribution, and how that finally flows down to the bottom line for the business. So what I'm hearing you say is that you're essentially taking your performance revenue and putting it into the brand awareness. Are are a lot of clients that you work with happy with that strategy or is that kind of tough to wrap their head around because they want profit at the end of the day? So it takes some time to help them understand. And there's a lot of education that we have to do on our end to help brands feel comfortable with it. At the end of the day, when top line revenue grows and you're not losing money and you're actually growing your profit as well, brands love it, right? (laughs) So Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's there is definitely this hump at the beginnings. And and part of that is because of how e-com businesses also structure their teams. And part of it is because growth and performance goes to one team, brand and marketing goes to another team. And so kind of marrying the two together and having people work together on that is not always easy. And so we get to play that middleman sometimes of, hey, we're helping both of you grow and this is how we're helping. Totally. How how do you decide how to properly allocate a client's advertising budget between those two campaigns? We'll do an analysis with our clients when we first start out around uh, what we like to call the break-even return on ad spend. And so we take their average margin or product margin and determine how much profit do they make every time they're, you know, they get a basket sold. We'll say, all right, we're comfortable spending up to that in media to cover that purchase. Work with the client to figure out break-even return on ad spend, figure out what kind of profitability buffer they want, 10%, 20%, 30%. And then we target that for our campaigns. So let's say your break-even return on ad spend is 1.5, meaning for every dollar you spend, you need 1.5 in return. Uh, we'll say, great, that's going to be our target for our campaigns. We're going to maximize 
our performance spends and drive as much return on ad spend as we can there. And then whatever we make from that, we'll invest in upper funnel. So top of funnel prospecting to introduce new customers to the brand. The overall campaign ends up at a 1.5, 1.7. And everyone's happy because we're not losing money and we're still growing the top line revenue. And if a brand said we want it to be 20% profitable, 30% profitable, we we bake that into the return on ad spend. We use multi-touch attribution to just make sure our top of funnel brand awareness campaigns are actually reaching the right customers. So we know, you know these, these awareness campaigns are actually leading to performance increases and growth. Yeah, because that's one of those things that you have to track a little bit more, I don't know, difficult, like brand, brand awareness is something that is not as tangible as performance. Yeah. And we can do brand recall studies. We can do brand lift studies, depending on the budgets that we're talking about and the channels that we're activating, right? So you're know, doing large CTV campaigns or large programmatic display campaigns, we can look back and see. But also, you know, we have a monthly media forecast and we'll know if revenue is growing. Uh, another indicator of that is, is our brand search campaign growing? Because if we're investing in brand awareness, you would expect that more people are searching for the brand and are interested in the brand. And we'd like to see brand search volume increase. So, you know, we'll put timelines against these things and, and have a really good indicators on is this working or not working? No, that's good. And we'll definitely talk about some of these um, indicators. Definitely. What, what sort of a uh, strategy? goes into deciding if a brand is ready to work with you or vice versa. You know, I, I, I hear you say you're generally looking for brands that are trying to break through. They've been putting in some effort and are just trying to break that ceiling a little bit or, or, or get out of this cycle that they've been in. So what goes into that strategy to see if a brand is ready to work with you or or not. Yeah, so we look at a few things actually. So we'll do a full assessment to really understand one, can we be can we actually help the brand and then is the brand the right fit for us, right? So the first part of that is we'll look at things like conversion rate and average order value. We know basic costs of advertising. We've got a series of benchmarks are actually published on our site. You can take a look at them, but for the most part, we have an understanding of how much it costs to get a customer. And so we need to make sure that your website conversion rate and your average order value can support that, especially as we start to scale up because your conversion rate will start to go down a little bit as we bring colder audiences and new new customers to the site. So just making sure that mathematically <laughs> everything kind of fits. And then on the the kind of qualitative or qualitative side, it's around, is there brand loyalty already? So do you have returning purchases? Are people uh, talking about you on social? Are you, do you have... Uh, good re product reviews because brands hate to hear this, but sometimes you're stuck because your product just isn't uh, fulfilling the need that people think. And you're really good at acquiring first time customers or really good at getting people excited the first time around. But then after that, something's falling apart. The product's not what they expected or it's not as strong as they wanted or whatever may be the case. So, um, you know, we really need to make sure that we have good products and then a, a really good website experience. From there, it's around budget. And do you have the capacity and willingness to want to scale? Because look, some brands, especially now as we go into uh, like leaner periods, they're really leaning in and saying, no, we need to maximize as much profit. We're going to give up full growth. We just need to stay flat this year and drive as much profit as possible. That's fine. That's a real marketing strategy. I would disagree with you. I would say in downturns, you generally want to increase marketing spend and try and capture more brand uh, volume. But you know, for some people, the strategy is let, let's kind of pass through this year. Those aren't the right fit for us because our team is going to really look at and figure out how do we actually grow this campaign? How do we find new opportunities for growth? So that's kind of what we're looking for. So what I'm hearing you say is you like people who are going to be more susceptible to an aggressive strategy. Yeah, an aggressive strategy with guardrails, right? So sure. we want to make sure that like we'll never come to you and say, hey, you should lose a ton of money to help you build your top line of revenue. Course. Like that's not a that's not a win for anybody. But you know, if you come to us and say, hey, we need to be a, a 10x return on ad spend and grow 50%, we're going to say, hey, I don't think that that's realistic. You're going to have to choose one or the other. But it doesn't mean that um, you can't grow profitably. It's just what's the where on the spectrum do you want to be? No, I think there's a lot of value in that. And speaking of your benchmarks, I, I, I was noticing on your website those extremely useful charts for these advertising benchmarks and trends based on data from high growth e-commerce and, and DTC brands from the last 30 days. So these charts show live feeds of KPIs or, or key performance indicators like you know CPM, cost per click, click through rate, conversion rate. For someone just just base baseline um, starting in the e-commerce world, 
why are these metrics important and, and, and what are they in a, in a very easy way? Yeah, we publish ben- these like media benchmarks because I think they're important. They add context to what's going in the market. So uh, just to give background on this, this is data uh, across all of our clients in terms of e-com data from media spends. Again, high growth, eight figure plus media. So you're talking large data sets. The key here is don't look at the number but look at the trend and compare your brand against the trend. So if everybody's you know, CPMs are going down and your CPMs are going up, you might want to question what's going on. Similarly, uh, click-through rates and conversion rates. The numbers are good. Those are our benchmarks. We, we hold our teams accountable to kind of making sure that everyone is, is close to at least the client's own benchmarks, but then we'll use you know, our, our industry trends as an indicator of, is the market moving in a specific way, for example? You know, come into Q4, CPM start to go through the roof. We know everybody's CPMs are going to go through the roof. We want to watch that and and figure out when that's going to end. So benchmarks are really important, not for tying your brand against the actual number, but by tying your brand against the trend. No, I, I totally agree. I, I think that you know when I've worked in a, in, in a similar world, having to figure out what CPM to be at is a little tough. So it's nice to have data like that that is kind of like. Your control set. Yeah. It kind of clears out some of the noise, which is is nice, uh-huh. right? So a perfect example of this one is like conversion rate. And we'll start to like track against day to day. So we know like during sale periods, conversion rates will go up and then we'll track coming up on Valentine's Day right now. So Valentine's Day, we're starting to see conversion rates kind of fluctuate a little bit as we get closer to Valentine's Day and more sales start to go and more gifting messaging starts to go. We'll start to see that conversion rate go up. So we like to look at last 30 days. We also publish compared to last year. So you can see how things are comparing year over year and and those trends. So our team uses it pretty regularly. It, uh, it, is, it has We have found it to be invaluable, uh, which is why we wanted to make it available to others. No, and I love it. How, how did you actually get that data? Yeah. So we have a full data uh, and analytics department. So all the data gets pulled in and we actually do uh, a lot of internal regressions on it on our team side. So the data set you guys are seeing is clean data that's out, but then our team has access to additional data sets off of it. So we collect it all, we keep it uh, and and manage against it from our end. Wow. That is extremely valuable then. I bet you have like, I don't know, the access to that is is really special to me. I, I feel like not a lot of agencies go through that avenue of collecting that data themselves. It's kind of just like, I don't know, they grab it when they need it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because with data, it's one of those things where as much as we can hold on to, we like to hold on to because you never know what will become important when it will become important. And so it, it it has been helpful, especially as we start to look at differences in trends pre-COVID, post-COVID and uh, coming into recession. So we try and model what's going to happen in a world where nobody knows what's going to happen. <laughs> and so the more data you have, the better it becomes. No, absolutely. I feel like it becomes more valuable over time too. So most brands that have been in the e-commerce space for a while mostly focus on ROAS or return on ad spend and lifetime value as their core KPIs compared to the ones we were talking about. I think it's because they're more revenue and dollar sign based. People are like business dollar sign, either my business is succeeding or not. But if you're hitting, if if a brand is hitting where they're supposed to be on their their CPM, their cost per click click through rate conversion rate everything else should follow ideally right so if all those other KPIs are in line then shouldn't the ROAS and LTV be too yeah so it's why CPM click through rate conversion rate are so valuable for us it those are early indicators of will we be successful or not and how much we can grow so we know as we scale up a campaign there'll be some impact on CPM we know there'll be an impact on click through rate and we know there'll be an impact on conversion rate so we can kind of do the math and model out how much can we spend before we hit you know, our losses on uh, or, or start missing our targets on, on our ROAS targets. Uh, we also break it out into two buckets. There's uh, media efficiency and then website experience and product market fit, right? So three, three key buckets, actually. The media efficiency is more around our CPMs. Uh, how efficient are we actually buying media and in what worlds, what ways are we actually hitting them? Click-through rate's another example of media efficiency. Are we getting the right creative in front of the right audiences? And then you're talking website experience and making sure the audience is the right fit. That's conversion rate. 
So we got the person to the website. Did they actually purchase the product or not? Was there a mismatch in terms of what we spoke about or how they're experiencing the product on the site? And then product efficiency is going to be around, like the product market fit is really around that conversion rate and AOV. Do they trust your product and your website enough to want to buy enough of it to drive up your average order value at a good enough rate to continue to scale your campaigns and scale your brand? That's kind of what we look at. And that's how we think about that sales journey. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more on the customer journey behind that because there's still like, how is the brand introduced? How are people like, what's the word of mouth that happened around it? What did the research do? But at the end of the day, we're really looking at those like key metrics. Were we efficient on our media buying, meaning our CPMs were within our thresholds and the click-through rates were high, uh, meaning we were driving enough people to the website to make a meaningful impact on the growth of the brand. More specifically, what what kind of media buying do you do? Yeah, so our core expertise is on digital media buying. So paid search, paid social, programmatic display, connected TV. We do some podcast sponsorships as well and, pod- and programmatic podcasts as well. So a lot of brand awareness comes in through our CTV campaigns and our programmatic display and digital out of home, things like that. Uh, and then a lot of our performance campaigns are you know, Google and remarketing campaigns, things in that you know, world. What, what's been the most successful that, that you've seen? What, what do you put the most eggs in the, in the basket for? I know it's kind of a case-by-case basis, but I, I, I found that different, different brands do different things where they, a lot of them are like, we're big on SMS and, and email and other ones that are like, we love social media. And I, I'm, I'm just curious what you see the, the trend. Of I'll t- I won't tell you what works the best because it is a case by case. I'll tell yeah. you the ones that I'm most excited about. Yes. Performance Max has been a rock star uh, from Google. Uh, it continues to perform really well. Uh, I think there's still a lot more that it can do. And, and I'm excited as more data comes into it, how much better it will get. Facebook launched Advantage Plus, which is similar. And I, I'm curious to see how that plays out so far. It seems like it's performing well, but performing well for Meta is all relative, which <laughs> is the key thing. Uh, and then uh, CTV is just like the golden star right now uh, on a brand awareness and and really good in, 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 from a high impact standpoint. The problem with CTV is you need really good creative. And that's been fantastic. Uh, when you have really good creative, you can really make impactful things. And then the last one is TikTok-ish. It's still trying to figure Ish. out... Yeah, it's still trying to figure out how how to make it work perfectly and what it plays. It works really well for impulse purchasing. It works really well for uh, low AOV products. But once you get into products that have high consideration or are you know luxury, uh, it ends up working better as a brand tool, awareness tool versus an actual like sales tool. So that's why I say ish. It also comes with a lot of baggage in that for TikTok to perform well, you need to have a really good organic TikTok channel too. Like they kind of need to go hand in hand. So, so TikTok ish is kind of what I'm going to say. Well, and and frankly, that's one of the ones that I don't use. So that's not. I did when I was working in that space a little bit, but now that's probably the only social media I don't use because I just think it's uh, it's. I don't know. I I I am not. The, the demographic for TikTok, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just definitely think it skews a little younger than some other social media platforms do. So some of the the, the, the brands and the strategies, I, I surely have never bought anything off TikTok. I, oh, I might have. I've fallen down that black hole. Have you? <laughs> well, and, and, and the reason I bring that up is because I'll see stuff on Instagram that it interests me. That, that I'll actually consider buying. And then my girlfriend buys stuff from Instagram all the time. Yeah. Um, e- even if it's not directly from that campaign, it's like, oh, that looks great. Let me go to Amazon and then buy it. I just think there's a lot more value there for my personal experience, you know? Yeah. And that's the hard part is just identifying what brands will do well in TikTok and what's the creative and the messaging. Um, and that's kind of what we do honestly really well is uh, for each one of our clients, we create something called... And going back to like our process. So we balance paid brand awareness and performance marketing. The way we do that is we create really detailed 12-month forecasts for all of our clients. We know three months will be relatively accurate. Six months is a little fuzzy. And then the final 12 months is actually really fuzzy. But it's super detailed and creates benchmarks for ourselves. So I spoke about the benchmarks that we publish. When we do our, our internal media forecasts, each channel by customer stage has a CPM, click-through rate and conversion rate target. 
So we can quickly look at our campaigns and say, hey, what's the actual versus what we had planned? What's working? What's not working? Where do we need to push? Where do we need to fix? Great diagnostic tool. We create what we call an ad experimentation plan or a learning agenda, which outlines out all of the ad tests that we want to run based on what KPIs are underperforming to our forecast, right? And so whenever we run TikTok, if we start to see things like conversion rate is low or click-through rate is low, it generally means we need to do a lot of creative testing, which is what ends up happening on TikTok a lot. So things like stylized ad versus influencer ad, ad with music, ad without music, things like that, that we end up having to work with our creative partners to figure out how do we get a lot of variations of stuff so that we can do that kind of testing? Because you're you're a big proponent of experimentation from what I've read, seen, and heard. Is is that from necessity or is that for creativity? So both, I would say. So I am a big promote, proponent of testing. I am a big proponent of structured testing, meaning we're not shotgunning this and just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. A lot of media buyers make the mistake of, we should always be testing, but we don't know what we're going to test. So we're going to test random things. And what people don't realize is that there is a major cost to testing. There is a cost on creating new creative. There's a toss, There's a cost that... Uh, if you are not confident that what you are testing will be better than what's running right now, you gave up a certain percentage of revenue to run that test. So if you think a test is going to lose, don't run it. Like it just like like lean into what you think is going to happen. You might be surprised from time to time, but if one out of every test works, nine tests lost you money. <laughs> is that is that helpful? That's not a good hit rate, right? So uh, that that's an important thing to also keep in mind. And so, yes, we are all about testing because it is what leads to incremental growth. We are all about structured and intelligent testing because we want incremental growth without all the baggage that comes with bad tests. I think there's a lot of value in you know saying, don't take away the profit or the revenue that you are bringing in to try to, I don't know, try something extra. I- I've just seen other people do that in the past in, in different fields. And I never really thought about the fact that they are losing money by experimenting. So putting all your eggs in these these baskets that you don't even know what they're going to result in is extremely risky. I actually wanted to pivot a little bit to, since, since you mentioned other media buyers, I found that with consistent growth in the amount of e-commerce brands, that also means that e-commerce growth agencies and marketing agencies have become more competitive subsectors as well. And so what's what's extremely interesting to me about like you and your agency is that your company has to provide its clients with the same service that you might use, you know, to to actually grow your brand of of query. So what's your brand philosophy for query and do you approach advertising your own brand the same way that you might for your clients. Interestingly enough, Query is uh, a client internally. Uh, there is a cool. team dedicated to it. Uh, it runs the same process that our clients do. Uh, media forecast, learning agenda, full data dashboards. I just happen to be the point of contact for my team. <laughs> and so you, you're, uh, the, you're your client. I am the client. So uh, it, it, it's fun for the team. It's fun for us. We get to try a lot of new things and, and really push the envelope. The one difference between us as the client and our clients as a client is we definitely skew a little bit more on the pushing the envelope for our campaigns because we can. And like, we love to use our campaigns as a testing ground for like, should we try this out or not? Or like, how do we actually do this? Things like that. Uh, But yes, uh, we run our own paid media. If you search us on Google, you will find you'll get hit with one of our paid search campaigns. Most likely we run full like social ads across all of it. Same setup around brand awareness to consideration and then all the way down to conversion. The difference with a B2B business versus a direct-to-consumer or B2C e-com business is we have to do a lot more education versus our B2C businesses do a lot more brand building. So our brand building comes through thought leadership podcasts like these, articles that we're writing that we then distribute. E-com brands need to do... Uh, photography and brand stories and brand experiences and catalogs and things like that to help sell that brand connection. And so same framework, different inputs is, I think is the key. Yeah. And I appreciate 
you being on here because of reasons like that. You know, I it's something that I, I thought about because I've I've talked with a few you know CEOs of, of growth agencies and marketing agencies, but I never really actually got to put it into words and ask someone. And and I think your answer makes a lot of sense because it is the the most in my opinion, sincere way of putting your money where your mouth is, is like, we use our services too. Don't get me wrong. It's not like we go to another growth agency for our own brand. I I just feel like that'd be a little, I don't know, hypocritical. Well, to be fair though, and and this is what I I will say, B2B is a unique beast compared to ADC and Ecom. So we've definitely thought about it. Uh, because I would love to go to a B2B agency that has uh, a really clear B2B process and framework. And they're like, we know exactly what content to create and how, like all of it, right? Uh, similarly about how our brands come to us because it's like, we understand product margin, we understand gross margin, we can help calculate their ROAS. as, like all of those kinds of things are already uh, built into our systems and processes. We've created a lot of benefits of being very niche and focused. My team has had to learn what that means for a B2B business. And and like, what is our CPA? How many leads do we drive? How does a sales team actually close those leads? Those are questions that we don't normally answer. Uh, so there is benefit to kind of finding an expert for what exactly you need. Sometimes you're not the expert for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you're always learning to some sort of effect. So we talked about this a little earlier, but more specifically, what are some of the mistakes that entrepreneurs make in their advertising campaigns before you come along? Or maybe yeah. even some of the some of the misconceptions that new clients might have about e-commerce media advertising as a whole. Yeah, I can tell you some of the common things that we run into. One is, let me think about how to bucket this in a way that actually makes sense uh, in a structured way. So I'd say the best place to start from is tools that are missing. So usually it's things like a sophisticated media forecast. What can we expect from our advertising? A reason why it's really important is because for e-com businesses, cash flow is king. So understanding how much you need to set aside for media allows you to make really smart inventory decisions and staffing decisions. And so uh, having that kind of forecast is really important, uh, especially as you're starting to scale and kind of push the envelope on your ability to spend. So that's one. Uh, the second one is a uh, really sophisticated learning agenda. So like, what are we testing? Why are we testing them? How do they impact our outputs? Uh, and then really clear data analytics. What we did this, this is actually what we returned. On the data analytics side, the biggest thing that we see that people should not be doing, especially when they're spending over 100K in media a month, so think 1.2 million in in annual spend, uh, don't use platform attributed data. Like that is a nice to know, but should not be used for your uh, forecasting and, and media mix modeling. The second one is, you know, we forecast and track off of last click data, meaning out of Google Analytics, what was the last channel that finally sold the product. Uh, But having multi-touch attribution tools at those ad spends uh, are really important to make sure that you are actually spending in the right way and and using that as guidance to figure out what channels you can kind of scale versus what channels are kind of capping out. Those are are three key things. And then the fourth one is uh, not staffing appropriately. You should have a marketing manager. You should have really good ops in terms of your 3PLs, your customer service, all of those kinds of things are really important. Uh, Merchandising is really important. Paid media is not a silver bullet. In fact, if it's driving too much of your revenue, that's a red flag for us. We want to make sure that the brand is also growing on its own, meaning customers are getting the product, are excited about the product and telling their friends about the product. We should see that in your organic growth. Uh, if we don't, and you're just straight paid media led, you're going to hit a cap because paid media gets more expensive as you scale. And does that also mean that if if people are are leaning on totally paid media for their revenue, you might not have a lot of return clients? You know, if you took the paid media away, are people still buzzing about your your product or your brand? That could be scary because the brand isn't really that strong enough on its own. Yeah, yeah, and that's the we run into those problems where like the repurchase rate is very long. I mean, it's a product you buy once every twelve months or once every you know two years. But those are really difficult brands to scale until they have another product that is able to kind of churn and, and get repurchase rates on. So yes, I think 
like when, for example, if we see paid media driving more than 50% of your revenue, we get nervous about that. Unless you're in like a high scale growth mode and you're really just using it to build your customer base. But like once you're at scale, meaning, uh, you know, eight figures plus again, we'd like to see media be between 30 and 40% of your top line revenue. That's usually a healthy mix. You should have other channels. <laughs> there are other channels like PR and influencer and affiliate uh, that you should be activating. Direct mail is another great one because catalogs are actually really effective. Things like that are all part of the marketing mix. And kind of the same way on the media side, we say, uh, don't only lean into Google and Facebook. Let's make sure we're kind of diversifying your channels. You should be diversifying your marketing. Not everyone, especially in the e-commerce, people who aren't in the e-commerce space are spending all their time on Google or Facebook like we might. Like a lot of people do spend a lot of time on their email. I've actually read something that said that's for a lot of business professionals is one of the, the biggest ways that you could actually get a hold of someone is because some people are getting a hundred emails a day when I don't I can tell you I'm not going to Google a hundred times a day. Yeah. And honestly the other thing too is just every channel plays a different role, right? So PR and influencer does a really good job of giving third party validation around your product and why it should be cool. And allows you tell a brand story. Advertising doesn't always tell a brand story in that way. Really figuring out how everything fits together and where each piece of that puzzle needs to be uh, is key for growth. And, and you know our team will tell our clients that like, we've capped out on our brand awareness, you need to do X, Y, and Z, or you can give us that dollar, but we'd actually prefer you put that dollar towards influencer or PR because it will be more impactful for you and the brand. So uh, I think ha- um, being able to have those strategic conversations is really important for the growth of our clients. Absolutely. So before we wrap up, I always ask this very last question to guests, e-commerce, And the e-commerce industry is 24-7 all the time, and it can be extremely high stress. And to promote a healthy work-life balance and mental health, free time needs to be applied properly in in hobbies and interests to kind of de-escalate the the chaos of it all, if you will. So long-winded way of asking, Samir, what do you do with your free time? (laughs) Uh, So I am a parent to two children, so there's really not a lot of free time, but my free time is usually spent with them. Uh, Reading, coloring, uh, stories, whatever I can do. Uh, there is nothing more fulfilling than that for me. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> I really want to thank you for for stopping by. It's been a, a, an extremely insightful conversation. I feel like we attacked it like a like a like a big web chart, not like a flow chart. If that makes any sense, so I'm a bit all I over love the it. place. Natural conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's a little more fun that way, and it's great to get to know you. And, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Until next time, Smear. I'd like to thank my guest, Samir Balwani, for joining me on the show and tune in next week when I sit down with Jimmy Kim, the CEO and co-founder of the email and SMS marketing company, SendLane. For more information about Samir, you can connect with him on LinkedIn. To learn more about Query, you can check out their website, wearequery.com, spelled W-E-A-R-E-Q-R-Y.com, or follow them on Instagram and Facebook at wearequery, spelled W-E-A-R-E-Q-R-Y. That's our show. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you come back to find new episodes now being published twice a week on every Tuesday and Thursday. Until next time.